I'm just going to give people a minute to to join. Welcome to ARMA International's webinar, Capture and Digital Transformation in a Work from Anywhere Environment. Today's webinar is sponsored by the great folks at Access. I'm Ann Snyder, Manager of Content Development at ARMA International, and I'll be your host and moderator for this webinar. For those of you who have attained your IGP, the Information Governance Professional Certification, today's webinar counts toward one continuing education credit in the information management category. If you have a question during today's webinar, feel free to ask in the Q&A box. We're unlikely to get to all questions today, but we'll respond to any remaining questions after the webinar has concluded. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping items I need to take care of. First up is professional membership. If you haven't checked out your membership benefits lately, uh, we're excited to offer online and virtual opportunities to connect and get resource through your membership. If you aren't an ARMA professional member, as you can see, there are a lot of great resources to take advantage of, and it's an affordable way to get resourced as an information professional. More information about ARMA informa uh, membership, excuse me, uh, and getting started can be found on our website at ARMA.org. Next up, ARMA InfoCon 2020. ARMA InfoCon is going virtual. The annual conference will take place uh, the week of October 26th with pre and post conference events, conference events to be announced soon. The virtual event will feature the same value as the in-person event, including great content, 100 plus sessions, an estimated 80 continuing education credits, interactive opportunities with business partners, and many new ways of community connecting. Register now for the lowest early bird, bird rates. This is a must attend event, it includes compelling keynotes, industry roundtables, best in class sessions, on demand learning and creative ways to connect with peers and industry partners. Without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. We're thrilled once again to have a fantastic speaker lineup. We're joined today by my colleague, Nick Inglis. He's uh, known to almost everyone on this call, I'm sure. He's the Executive Director of Content and Programming at ARM International. He is an author of uh, the information, the comprehensive overview of the information profession and countless other articles. Uh, he has been hard at work these last weeks building some great content for InfoCon 2020. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, you're too kind. So we also have two uh, great subject matter experts from Access. I'll let them introduce themselves to give them an opportunity to tell us more about the, the work that they're doing. Let me welcome Kurt Thies and Steve Neely. Thank you. All right. So uh, I'm Kurt Thies. I'm with uh, Access and uh, I'm the, uh, the first product evangelist for the organization, which is a, a unique and singular role. Uh, I describe it as uh, having the opportunity to gather and share insights uh, with our customers and within our organization. Uh, I've grown up in, uh, in this community of, of records and information management professionals. I'm sure there are a lot of familiar faces out there uh, attending this conference and uh, started off working uh, in a records department, uh, then started developing software and technology solutions, and have really spent my career uh, focused uh, in that area. Um, so I'm excited to uh, participate in this conference today. And good morning, I'm Steve Neely. I'm the Consulting Services Vice President. Um, I've been in this industry for 30 years now. Uh, the first 15, I was an in-house records and information manager, um, also a privacy officer. And the last 15, I've been um, in the consulting side of the business. Um, I'm certainly focused on helping clients with their retention schedules, uh, privacy assessments, uh, records program assessments, policies and procedure developments, training, um, anything to do with records and information management, I've probably touched it, uh, as well as touching a, a number of verticals. So everything from education to oil and gas, pharma, banking, you name it, I've, I've probably had a client that's been in those industries. So I'm looking forward to sharing some information today and, and I'll turn it back to you, man. thanks. Great, thank you so much, Kurt and Steve. So today, uh, today's discussion builds on a webinar and white paper that we developed with Access last year. Uh, the webinar, Information Governance and Digital Transformation, must begin with a new understanding of capture and the corresponding white 
paper are available at arma.org, but we'll make sure that we include those links uh, in, in the, to the links to those resources when we distribute the recording from today. We're revisiting this topic and building on the material in light of what all of us have faced in the last few months and continue to face during this pandemic. If your organization hadn't previously undergone a digital transformation, you received quite a wake up call recently. And if you've already started this process, the last few months have exposed the holes that still remain in the ways that we work when we work remotely. In short, working remotely out of necessity has opened our eyes to the constraints and costs of being tied to a physical workplace, uh, being tied to paper-based processes, as you know, including our active and legacy paper uh, records. It's also, though, opened us to the possibilities of being able to have an office essentially anywhere, this concept of working from anywhere. We'll start today by defining capture, uh, what we mean by it and where it fits within the information lifecycle. We'll move to a definition of digital transformation. That's a, you know, that's a term that, that means different things to different people. Um, and we'll look how we've responded to this crisis and you know, have we actually undergone a permanent shift? Is this a paradigm shift or will we resume working the way we used to before the crisis? We'll look at some of the stages of, of adaptation uh, to working remotely and what we can learn from that uh, to build a successful transformation, a digital transformation strategy. So if you haven't gotten started, how you can use what other people are doing in the field um, and, and learn from that. And finally, um, we'll look at how digital transformation can make your business more efficient, responsive, flexible, and resilient and make you better basically to uh, weather a storm like the one that we're facing right now. Um, we'll conclude then uh, with Q&A, so please make sure you, um, you know, bring your questions uh, to our attention in the Q&A box. Uh, without further ado, let's move to capture and what we mean by that. So when people think of capture, they often think specifically of scanning, and that makes some sense. Uh, is certainly from a document management perspective. Historically, much of our information, our documents were born in a paper format. Some of them still are. And the only way that we could you know, manage them digitally was by scanning. As you can see from the framework in the graphic, the right capture is much more than scanning though. Uh, ARMA defines capture as any means of adding a piece of information into an information uh, system. And this is from the ARMA guide to the information profession. That's a pretty broad definition. Um, ARMA offers this framework uh, that identifies five key modes of, of capture. The first one is, again, the one we're probably most familiar with, the first two actually, imaging. So imaging is using scanning technology to create images of information, uh, creating picture-based formats like JPEGs, PNGs, or TIFFs. Uh, it doesn't always involve the extraction of text, and without that extraction of text like paper, it's not machine readable. Uh, to the right of that is digitization. Again, it starts with scanning, but it has the extra layer of text extraction included. Uh, OCR, for example, optical character recognition, ICR, intelligent character recognition. Um, and you can take different approaches. You could do partial or full extraction. Partial extraction can be utilized to fill specific metadata fields related to the file, whereas full extraction can often create a, a file that's searchable or a re machine readable. So you can find it uh, in your you know, uh, company-wide searches or use it in e-discovery, et cetera. Um, next, you see uh, at the lower left-hand corner is file upload. Um, information, if it's created digitally and then uploaded, say, from a local, side, uh, local uh, file site into an information system is also included within this concept of capture. Uh, to the right, you see native file creation. Sometimes uh, systems create pieces of information without the separate step of uploading it. So many modern information systems have the capability of creating information in a native file creation, create a creation application within the system itself or through a bridge to other existing uh, creation applications, content creation applications like uh, Microsoft Word or Google Docs. Uh, on the bottom, you see integration, and this is leveraging information that's created or managed in one system within your uh, technology ecosystem in another system within that same ecosystem. And this concept, this type of capture is slightly more nuanced, but it fits within that broader definition that we've uh, given you here of um, adding a piece of information into an information system. And typically, we can think of organizations uh, capturing information in many 
uh, dis disconnected or separate systems within their organization. Harmonizing metadata or creating integrations across those systems so that one system can fully leverage the content created in another system effectively adds that information to those information systems. Um, and so uh, we consider this activity within um, our concept of capture. Kurt, I know you had some thoughts on, on integration that you wanted to add. Yeah, and, and, and I think this is a great uh, way to kind of help uh, get our minds around uh, th this concept of, of capturing and with it digital transformation because represented here, we have the different, different ways that we are essentially uh, migrating from one format uh, to another. So mm -hmm. talking about going from, from paper and paper processes to uh, electronic and, and digital processes. And uh, then looking within each, each organization and how that applies to our, our, our setting. So uh, we have kind of the, the traditional view of, you know, we're scanning, we're imaging, we're digitizing. Uh, but I think this does a great job of showing that it captures much more than that. Uh, a lot of things start off electronic and uh, go into that environment or are created, uploaded. Um, but particularly with integration, now we're crossing into kind of a broader threshold where we're not just talking about paper to digital, we're talking really at a, a data level. How do we have systems talk to each other? Because when we're uniquely identifying records and information um, and communicating between systems, uh, we're talking about the same thing across different business line applications, performing transactions, uh, different functions, that integration uh, is sort of the, uh, the last mile um, that a lot of us are, are uh, focused on uh, within this journey. And we're not just at a document, a record level, we're now at a, a data level to mm -hmm. tie things together. And I think that's a, a real critical part of, of capture. So a, a term that's likely to come up in today's discussion is, is intelligent capture. What exactly does that mean? Yeah, so intelligent capture, and, and I'll let Steve uh, uh, add to this because uh, uh, he does a lot of work here. So intelligent capture is how we uh, uh, assist the user because uh, classification is cre key to retrieving information, how we organize, mm -hmm. we categorize the information. So the intelligence is how we take that piece of information that on its own is a unique image, a unique document, and allow it to be classified and um, do that in an intelligent manner. So we're gonna be able to retrieve it later. So uh, it takes a lot of um, technology to emulate what we've traditionally done. Here's a file, here's where I'm gonna put it so I can organize it and find it later. So this is, this is essentially doing capture in a, in a well thought out planned strategic way. Correct. Okay. Steve, did you have anything you wanted well, to add on that? Yeah, there's a flip side to that conversation. I mean, a lot of people, when you say the word intelligent capture, they automatically go to AI, mm -hmm. right? So they're, they're looking at the machine learning and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I think I like and prefer what Kurt had to say about it in terms of it's not just about throwing technology at it. It's about having a planned approach as well. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's excellent. I, I agree with that. Uh, Steve, uh, sorry, Nick, did you have anything to add before we move to the next slide? Well, I, I think it's actually interesting that that last uh, box, the integrated systems, that was something that we had initially um, not considered. So the earlier versions of this graphic don't include that. That actually came and was added because of a discussion we were having, uh, and yourself and I, with a, a couple of us that said, hey, wait a second, what about a piece of information that moves from one system to another because those systems are integrated. Is that not adding a piece of information mm -hmm. into an information system? And we said, you know, it was one of those moments where we went, Oh, that's a great point. Let's, let's, mm -hmm. let's add that in. And uh, that, that's sort of been the, the guiding principle here is build on, on each other's knowledge. Um, and a graphic like this really is representative of that. And I, that and I do, I, I do think that this graphic, this this graphic does does you know change the our conception of 
of what capture is and and it's I, I think again the the two at the the two items at the top that are under scanning are the ones that were traditionally thought of as capture and so um, I think there's a lot of information in this this simple seemingly simple infographic yeah um, so next we'll move to um, how capture is related to the information cycle and I think most people are familiar with the confirmation the concept of an information life cycle it's a term that is used to describe the pathway in which information flows throughout an organization. You often see it, um, it, it just expressed in stages here uh, as the first step in uh, the information life cycle capture has an effect on all of the downstream, uh, the, the succeeding steps, basically everything to the right of capture in this infographic. You know, questions like, did you put the invoice, the contract, or the project document into the, the right system where it belongs so that it's available at the right place at the right time when it's needed for effective use and collaboration? You know, did you um, collect the right metadata or, or other text as part of your capture process to facilitate decisions about, for example, how long you're going to retain it and whether it needs to be placed on legal hold or something should that come up. And this is exactly what um, Kurt and Steve were talking about uh, in terms of intelligent capture. Uh, so simply put, better capture leads to better information management throughout uh, the entire uh, information life cycle. Do you have anything to add on that, Steve or, or Kurt? Well, I think what is interesting here is we now move with the information life cycle to the, the, the concept of process. Mm -hmm. um, how does it go from one end to the other? And uh, that's a lot of what, what we're, we're focused on. You create and you use information, then you store it, and then you retrieve it. And it's in that, you know, when am I using it? When do I need it? How do I find it again that uh, the... the the complexity comes in. And if you look at it from a industry perspective, uh, what does it mean if I'm an insurance company? So I'm creating policies and I have claims. What's that information lifecycle in that process looks like, look like versus another industry? Um, and that's where we kind of drill into uh, the behavior uh, mm -hmm. of this life cycle. And some of these life cycles here, when you're speaking about the, the industries too, I think it's interesting that some of those life cycles are incredibly long. Uh, pharma is, you know, life of, life of product plus 25 years. So that's longer than many of us are going to be around probably. So, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a long term, uh, it's, a, it's a long game. We say IG is a long game. So, uh, Steve, I think you had well, something to add there, sorry. The initial, yeah, depending on the initial media, if it's a, a hard copy, capture might not be the first thing. It might be somewhere moved down that line because we're going to go to that digitization process mm -hmm. and, and bring it into our electronic system. So although we've started off, and I, I think generally speaking, this is a correct model, that capture could also be somewhere else on, on this continuum as well. Mm -hmm. So what, let's move to uh, just the definition of digital transformation. It seems like everyone is talking about digital transformation these days, and that is conceived of as anything from, you know, going paperless to making process-specific improvements, which you've talked about here a little bit already, um, and even, you know, something more significant like, you know, this disruptive paradigm shifting change in the way that we do business. So, obviously, to use digital technologies to transformation to transform anything you actually have to have the information accessible to those technologies and that's what we we're talking about when when we talk about capture what what do you think um is meant by the term digital transformation so i, I think it you know we start to see a lot of these become loaded terms mm -hmm. in our industry and breaking them down um so that we can we can think about them and, and uh, really get to their, their meaning. So digital transformation, um, you know, we're essentially talking about going from, from paper to electronic format. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, uh, like we, we looked at on the last slide, it's a change in the process. There's a way that we manage paper um, and, you know, our record keeping practices really originated there. We have paper, we put it in a container, we file it. Um, mm -hmm. We have a methodology, we retrieve it. That's very different when it's electronic and we have to think about it uh, differently, but there are a lot of advantages. And I think as, as we're focusing here, uh, the pandemic has really forced um, and, and surfaced the fact that um, 
we, we are operating remotely. Uh, digital transformation is now a, a necessity and it, it shows where we are in that, uh, that maturity um, or, or journey. And you know, we're, we're faced with the, the consequences um, right now. So it, it gets us to a, a different way of uh, managing a process and the, the information. Um, once it's digital, we can, we can do a lot more things with it. We can put it in the cloud, we can distribute it, um, we can access it. Um, and you know, we're trying to focus on how we get from one end to the other and then we, what we do on that other side. Just out of curiosity, in, in terms of the differences between, you know, how, how people manage information, I know that, you know, we had, we have pretty thoroughly established approaches to handling, you know, our paper records, and there's a certain rigor around that, that I, I don't always see when I'm working with people on their digital records, or, you know, that, that it seems easier, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's available, it's, it's already in the digital system. And so they think there's not, there's not much more to do with it. And so, you know, making sure that you are, you know, capturing that surrounding information so you can find it later uh, is sometimes, you know, not given the same thought that it's given for paper. Is that what you're seeing out there in the field as well? Yeah, I mean, I've had clients over the last number of years before all the pandemic hit, wanting to be paperless, mm -hmm. not not without paper, but paper light maybe is the better term. Mm -hmm. And that that transformation has been overnight because the clients are now realizing, look, <laughs> paper light isn't going to work for us. We we don't have the ability to move that little bit of paper that we had around. Mm -hmm. So we're going completely digital. And what that's done is it's it's taken the ease of being able to walk over to a file cabinet or a file room and put your hands on that document. Now we have to have better ways of describing the documents. So better metadata standards within the organization. We have to have, you know, systems and structures to organize these. You know, they used to be in alphabetic order or numeric order on the shelves. Mm -hmm. Well, now we've got to have that same structure, that taxonomy placed into our electronic environment, or we've got to have great search tools. And now that can be a variety of things. I mean, um, so yeah, it's, I think the digital transformation is, is forcing people to think a little bit more about how they actually describe their records. Because as Kurt said earlier, it's, it's not about putting it away. It's easy to put it away. It's mm -hmm. getting it back that's the trick. Yeah. Um, so we have to make sure we have the right tools in place to be able to do that. So just let's keep moving here. We have a, a ton to cover. So how is, uh, is Capture a first step both in, in information governance and uh, digital transformation. We've already talked a little bit about how it's the first step, but let's just tie, you know, tie these concepts together. Yeah, it, I mean, it kicks everything off, right? I mean, you've got to have all of your metadata standards and, and all of the information governance pieces, mm -hmm. um, controls, security, uh, descriptions, all those things that are going to come out as part of your overall governance plan. And that's where Capture is going to, to initiate all of that. It's, it's going to kick the process off because without good capture, um, the rest of it is going to be a mess. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd like to emphasize that too, that, that the considerations that you're making as part of that intelligent capture are not just about retrievability, which is a key part, but also about the security and access controls under there. I think that's something that, you know, again, people, if you think of capture as just scanning, you're not, you're not getting the whole picture that it is really the first step here in this this entire information life cycle so that everything that needs to be part of that um, needs to be part of that initial consideration uh, when you when you first put the information into the system i'm sorry i, I cut someone off there nick was that you sorry about no, that i do this no all worries. the time to him he's, he's, he <laughs> tolerates it for some reason i i like kurt and steve's explanation of uh the, the thoughts around intelligent capture because what what you're saying is essentially look at the purposes for which you're going to use that information later on so that you can make the appropriate decisions about that information from the moment it's it's going to be captured that's exactly what we're doing in information governance at a larger scale looking across all of these things not just at this moment of capture so if we're looking at the, the world of information governance as being uh, this, this, this large thing, intelligent capture is looking at that one piece capture through the lens of information governance and the way that it, it was described there. And I think that's a great positioning for it because a lot of people look at 
information governance as this huge thing that is challenging to achieve because frankly it is. Mm -hmm. But if we look at it just as in, in terms of one aspect and apply those same precepts in just this one aspect, you start to achieve information governance. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, I do love that positioning. Um, yeah. yeah. Are we hearing a different term for intelligent capture is basically strategic capture? Uh, it ties it up with IG then. I, I like that positioning. Yeah, and, and I think it, it highlights a, 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 a key point that um, where we need improvement. So, so Anne, as you were saying, you know, the, the discipline and the rigor that we had in the physical records management has not really translated when we're talking about digital and electronic information. Mm -hmm. Um, because it has different attributes. We create records and we rely upon technology, the ability to, to search uh, content to find it later instead of disciplined mm -hmm. classification, taxonomy, indexing. And, and it's at that point of capture where uh, the, we're not spending the, the time as we look at these, these different ways that things are, things are coming in. The discipline isn't, isn't there, the behavior and we pay for it down the line. Mm -hmm. So There's pandemic now is showing, okay, whoops, we can't find something because the way that we captured it didn't, didn't have the right uh, methodology in that process. And I don't, I, I mean, what I'm seeing so far is that the you know, this reliance on search, we think we can just, you know, punch in the words we're looking for that yeah. it's, it's not keeping up or at least not producing the, the results that we want. We still need that sort of mental structure um, you know, and I, I, I argue with people about this all the time is, you know, our, do we need file folders and th that kind of structure and taxonomy and maybe not um, functionally if we have good search technology, but mentally as human beings, we need it to, to help us understand where we put our things. Yeah, there's a, there's a great comment from, from one of our attendees in the chat, uh, Nitza, or Nitza, sorry if I'm pronouncing your name improperly, capture is like onboarding a new document. I really like that. <laughs> well, yeah. and the great thing about that is, is when you onboard a new person, you teach them about all the rules of the organization. Capture is exactly the same way. And I love the way you put it, Nick. I mean, we've got to have the information governance infrastructure there. We've got to look at security. We've got to look at privacy. These days, we're taking people's temperatures as they walk through the door. Privacy is a huge consideration, right? So we've got to be able to apply all of this right up front um, in, our, in our taxonomies, in our classification schemes. All that has to be there. Yeah. So let's let's turn to the 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 sort of the elephant in the room, which is you know the pandemic that we're all um, you know in the I I want I wanted to say in this webinar that you know that we've just this this process we've just been through, but it seems like it's going to be around for some time. So how is how is working from home and and living remotely, including you know doing you know. Uh, zooming on doctor visits, cocktail hours, and visits with friends and family. How has that changed our perspectives? And, and I think we, we had, when we were talking about this, we, we saw it as going through, you know, several different phases, a sort of immediate response, the settling in, and then and sort of the, the now what. So can we start just first with, with what's, what's our immediate experience? And it just, just, just to talk about what our shared experience has been um, in this new environment and what, what it tells us about uh, you know, how, how we can work differently. Yeah, and I, I think that I mean, this is the, 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 the forcing function. We're all living this same experience universally. It's a very odd time. Um, and even the fact that we have an acronym for, for working from home, we're all working from home now. This is something that, you know, the, the second week in March, everything changed. No one knew you know, before March uh, 11th, what was going to happen um, in the next week. Um, so we went to, to the immediate response, grab your stuff, go home, um, we'll figure it out. Uh, mm -hmm. We're focused on, can we get toilet paper? You know, th those type of things, um, a bit of, uh, you know, crisis response mode. Then, you know, we, we were thinking, all right, well, is this going to be a week? Is this going to be two weeks? Mm -hmm. We went through the settling in phase and we started realizing, okay, we had, you know, how do we use uh, Zoom? How do we use Teams? How do we continue on with, with business? And how do we start figuring out um, our, our processes today? And I think now, as you referenced, we're in this 
for a much longer haul than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. And we're also now having time to reflect and realize it's not really going to go back to the way it was before. Mm -hmm. This has been a, a grand experiment in many ways. Um, and I think that's kind of the, the intrigue. Um, are, where are we with digital transformation, digital processes? How do we function if we all work from home? What happens? We now are seeing those results um, and it creates an opportunity because uh, we found a lot of, uh, we've gone through adoption. We know how to have, like we're doing here, a, a conference with a thousand people remotely and online. We figured out how to do that. We wouldn't have done that before. We're figuring out the same things with our daily jobs and our, our, our work efforts and how to leverage these tools. And I mean, one thing we, we, we also talked about, in, you know, as we were preparing for this is that we, we found people didn't have the kind of personal in infrastructure available to them. We, we talked about the concept of technology deserts yeah. that people just didn't have the setup at home to support this. But we, I think we also saw that um, even for organizations, I, I had an experience of trying to um, assist my my a family member with uh, a you know a hearing with a government agency, and they just were not equipped to send paper documents. So they're no longer working in an office, and they they didn't have a system to effectively send me those documents electronically, or even the ability to you know react to. Um, a system when I, I gave them a, a way to, to transfer the files to me, they, they didn't have a way to fit that into their policies that would allow them to send the documents to me in that way. So are you seeing similar things? Well, I, I think it's very interesting because th this, this pandemic has hit at a certain time and place and mm -hmm. we are pretty well equipped to carry on. Mm -hmm. uh, if this had happened just 10 years ago. I mean, look at the, mm -hmm. the span of, uh, of time. 10 years ago, would we have had smartphones? Would we have had the bandwidth? Could we have had this video conference uh, when we're, you know, we have dial-up modems? Um, it's a very recent uh, stage that we have the, the tools, the infrastructure, the technology uh, to be able to do this. And mm -hmm. so looking at the continuum of, of records and information management, we're at a new stage. There are new mm -hmm. capabilities, and it allows us to then look forward. How do we take advantage of this? It's a new paradigm. Let's mm -hmm. let's leverage that. So I mean, that's, well, that's it's true. funny. You wanted to... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Steve. Sorry, go Sorry. Ahead. no, go ahead, Steve. That's okay. Well, I was just going to say it's funny you say you know that that paradigm shift because one of our our attendees here has mentioned you know something as simple as collecting the office mail. Mm -hmm. um, even as as a as a vendor, we we responded by offering that type of a, a centralized service. We'll go in, pick up your mail, or have it redirected to us, scan it, and, and put it into a place for the client to access. It's changed how we even do business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to to right to the basics. Uh, one of the other people said here, it's a you know a force of growth, and I think that's absolutely a true statement because I've I've been watching our clients slowly migrate to less and less paper. Well, this has pushed us in an overnight way into almost no paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was, I think my, my favorite thing that I've, I've seen in re regards to, to digital transformation of late is uh, a post, I think it was by Teo Priestley, um, where he said, who, who led digital transformation efforts in your organization? Was it your CIO or was it COVID-19? Yes. And I think for a lot of organizations, it was COVID, even though we knew these technologies existed and we knew that um, the, the, the things that we've been preaching for the past decade, mm -hmm. um, a lot of organizations just didn't have the stuff in place uh, in advance of this and quickly got it in place. I mean, fortunately, there are so many tools that are readily available that companies were able to quickly switch mm -hmm. and change their processes. But my goodness, what... Uh, the, the range of, of actions that uh, we saw from companies that were far behind and for an organization like Arma, where we were already in a work from home, uh, mm -hmm. a diversified workforce, less impactful for us, um, really just impactful for us in helping other organizations mm -hmm. um, uh, do some of these things that we're, we've already been doing.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the shared experience that, you know, all of us uh, on this call are, are going through. And even like, you know, we, we've been using Teams for a long time, but we use it as a, a teleconferencing tool. When you turn on video, like we're doing now, it creates a different level of engagement. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and everyone had to go through that adoption of learning the different features and, and functions and how do we share documents? How do we collaborate? And this, this grand experiment, if you will, has gotten us over that, that threshold. I, I tell the story of like, uh, I think it was Mother's Day where, you know, okay, let's get on a Zoom call. Mm-hmm. Well, teaching your parents how to use Zoom for the first time takes a while, but pretty soon it's like, oh, you know, can we get my sister on it? Oh, my, what about my niece? And she's in a car. Okay, she can dial in on the phone. Pretty soon we've got, you know, a dozen people on this call. We ne- it, the technology was there. We'd never done it before. Mm-hmm. Now we know how to use it. So just I, the question I have is, is, you know, so we've seen, we, we, we've had this technology, there's been... Uh, it, it's hard to get people to adopt it. And now we finally have, uh, you know, what seems to be an understanding of the importance of it. Is this, do we think this is really a paradigm shift? Will people move to this technology? Um, or are we going to sort of go back into our normal performance? We often see that, uh, you know, companies will respond to a crisis. Um, that's the impetus for, you know, you know, cleaning up something or, you know, adopting a new technology, then shortly thereafter, they go back into um, their old ways of working. So is this a paradigm shift uh, or, um, or not? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think there are certainly um, going to be some major shifts in how we operate on a daily basis. We now know that people can work from anywhere. They don't have to necessarily be in the office. That said, I still think there's that missing piece that people still want that one-to-one contact. As much as the videos are great, it's not, as, not the same as being in the room and having a discussion with somebody, reading their body language, you know, and, and, and being up close and personal, as it were. So I think there's going to be a, a balance. I think, yes, we will see a major shift in the adoption of the technologies and, and honestly, in the change in how the workforce is put together in an organization. Now I know if they can work from anywhere, I don't have to hire somebody in this town where the rent right. might be $3,000 a month. I can mm-hmm. hire that person who's paying $1,200 a month way back there. Um, it's going to change things for sure. And, and I think that uh, those are great points. And I, I tend to be on the, this is a paradigm shift. It's not going back um, to, to look at the opportunity that that, that creates um, to kind of, force our, our mind to think, we, we now have learned that what is possible. And, I, and you know, like most of you guys, I've spent my, my career on the road. I'm traveling and where the customer is, you know, where you need to be. Um, this is the longest I've ever, you know, stayed at home, <laughs> stayed, in, stayed in one place. And you sort of adapt and you create these different um, processes and engagements but we are seeing that the, the concept of the office that we all grew up with, it's probably gone. Just like, mm-hmm. you know, retail, uh, we're buying things online. Do you still go to a store? Um, we're seeing everything change. Mm-hmm. And those companies that are using this to transform, to adapt, mm-hmm. are coming out much stronger. I look at restaurants and some people have figured out you can order online, you can uh, get a pickup service. They have the tables outside and then the other restaurant is closed. Mm-hmm. Someone adapted and figured out how to keep going. Someone didn't. It's a I, Dar- Darwinian process. <laughs> I, I think there's probably a generational thing here too, uh, as people that have been more comfortable in offices for most of their lives. I think some, some of those folks will feel more comfortable going back to an office later, whereas folks that maybe have less experience there, they're building their experiences right now and probably future generations will be simply working from home, may not ever have a, an office experience. Mm-hmm. Interesting, interesting thoughts that come from, from those. Well, and, yeah, and now you're, you're, you know, I was having a conversation with people earlier today about, um, you know, we're talking about work. This is impacting all of our children and the educational system where they're having to deal with it 
not about their, their work process, their educational process. How do they bring that remotely? Whole different topic, but you know, they're going to grow up having lived through the pandemic in very formative years. Mm -hmm. And that will probably shape their, their work environment, their work life and how they, they deal with that. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely think this is a, a paradigm shift. Um, I don't, I don't think the future of the office looks, looks like it's looked in, in the past. Um, it, it may take a while for us to get there though. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is the moment we're going to look back at as the point where the paradigm shift began. I don't know that we've ended at, at, at this moment yet, that paradigm shift. I agree. No, I, I agree yeah. with that. So let's let's just um, move on. We're just uh, I, this is a fantastic conversation, but I want to move on to sort of the the promise of what what we can do with this. So, you know, Kurt and 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 Steve, looking at your customer base, what are you seeing in terms of how customers are adapting? Uh, I know we talked about there being sort of different phases of this, um, and and what can we learn from those experiences? Uh, what can you know? What what can we learn about those experiences to to build a successful digital transformation strategy if we haven't, or we're working to improve uh, what we do have in place? So starting first with with you know, digital processes, uh, you know, and, and capturing in um, you know incoming paper, for example. Yeah. So we've had a, a number of clients actually. Uh, I'll give them some kudos being a little bit ahead of the curve and trying to make some of that decision. Um, already shrinking their office footprints, recognizing some of this can be done remotely so that people can work you know, from anywhere. And so we've actually seen some success stories already with some of the clients. The biggest thing that, that we've had is the decision of what to scan when they're making that conversion from paper to electronic. And uh, some clients have come and said, can you give me a price to scan all the stuff that we have? And we went, whoa, no, we don't want to do that because it's going to be a really big bill. We know that that's you're not going to scan the world. That's that's just craziness. So let's pick and, and choose and make sure we get the right the right information captured. Mm -hmm. um, we have to start not only from a risk perspective. Um, there's certainly the volume perspective of we can't capture everything and store it all. That's that's just not reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, then we also have to go into uh, applying retention. And so have you got those systems in place? What this has forced people to do is is actually really look at their governance processes. Mm -hmm. And, and what they have. Do they have a good, complete, up-to-date, defensible retention schedule? That's a, that's a key starter for this because if you're going to start putting this stuff away, you better know how long you're going to keep it and what you're going to do with it in the end. Um, so it's, it's always about the long goal, not the short goal, because uh, so many people are like, we got to capture it all. Well, no, 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 no. What do we really need to capture and how long do we need to keep it in order to be compliant and also serve our, our customers better, right? So They've been looking at things like that. Of course, they've been uh, addressing their inactive boxes. You know, now going, hmm, we haven't, we haven't turned over these boxes for five years. Um, have we even looked at our retention schedule related to what's being stored in that paper format? Mm -hmm. Let's, again, let's reduce that footprint, not just in, in terms of office space, but in terms of our overall records holdings. Mm -hmm. Have we been creating records almost for a convenience purpose? And so they're, they're actually looking at some of the business processes and say, let's create what we actually need and stop, you know, creating stuff that's just sort of convenient and nice to have, and, um, but it doesn't have long-term value, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, there's, there's been a lot there. I mean, people, we, I, on my side of the business, I, I do a lot of policy writing. I, I don't think I've ever been busier updating people's policies than, than we have lately because people are recognizing, wow, our policies just have not kept up with the times, they've not kept up with the technology, and they certainly haven't kept up with this whole idea of working from home and having people you know, have to maybe take physical files home in, in the short term. Mm -hmm. But now that they've got them, what are we gonna get? You know, are they gonna capture them at home? Do they have scanners? Mm -hmm. Are we gonna get these all brought back to the office? There's, there's a whole pile of decisions that the clients are making right now. I like the fact that you pointed out that it's it's not a scan everything approach. It just has the way of, you know, replicating bad records practices uh, in the paper world into the you know digital yeah. world, and that just seems like a yeah. nightmare and a, and a and a remediation project uh, for somebody else down the road. Um, yeah. Kurt, do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I, and I think this is a pretty pretty rich rich topic here because we're seeing uh, as we as we talk to to customers. Um, 
what, what their experience has been, and it kind of highlights everything we've been talking about. Um, when you're working remotely, paper is a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, look at our business. We, you know, people store, store information in, in boxes. Uh, are we going to drive the truck to everyone's house to give them what they, they need? So, you know, our, our ability to scan and deliver it digitally becomes important. That integration into their systems that we talked about becomes very important. And these have been capabilities, but they haven't been really front and center. So mm -hmm. we, have been, we have been surfacing those. And some of the, uh, the use cases that kind of, kind of crystallize that, if you look at, uh, you know, law firms, uh, typical, you know, office environment, we've all watched, you know, the, the LA law and the, the, the shows. Um, so I'm now an attorney, I'm working from home. The files that I'm working on for mm -hmm. this case, uh, they're in the office, they're in a, a paper file. That's right. a problem. And there are three people working on this, this case that I need to collaborate on. So even if I have the piece of paper I need, you know, <laughs> there are two or three other people who need to see, see that and we can't be, you know, running back and forth with that, uh, that paper. So you, you need to be in a digital environment uh, just because it has different attributes. Mm -hmm. But it, as Steve points out, we ha there are a lot of implications that go along with that. What's the official record? What, what do you do for destruction? Everyone's now creating paper at home. Um, how, do you, how do you shred it? Mm -hmm. How do you dispose of it? How do you enforce the, those policies? So we have a different set. Just because the paradigm has shifted, it doesn't solve all of our problems. Mm -hmm. We now have different challenges. Different Exactly, to focus on and, and overcome. And can you talk just a little bit more about well, that sort of the, under the policy implications? Because this is a thing that, again, it's, it's it, it, you know, it's, it's similar, but similar problems, but different. What, what happens if we're now, if we are working digitally, how does that, dig a, can you dig a little bit more into what the policy implications are for that, for people? Um, you, you touched on, on one, of, one of them, just, you know, what's the, what's the record and why is that so important? Steve, you're the expert here. Well, I, yeah, so we, we deal with a lot of multinationals, um, people that are across many boundaries, not just multiple states, but multiple countries. And so this, the policy implications actually are changing because we may have rules still in place that are yesterday's rules that talk about you can't move things across boundaries. You still have to have some wet ink signatures. You still have to have a paper version. Well, our governments are actually going to have to catch up because that's not going to fly. We can't, literally, we can't do that anymore. If, if we are storing things in cloud locations and uh, all the impacts that are going to come with that, uh, you know, this sharing across multiple jurisdictions, because now my staff doesn't all work in, you know, Chicago where I'm based. They work all over the country or even all over the globe. I have to be able to share that information accordingly. I mean, there's lots of privacy laws out there that are going to impact this stuff too. So, I mean, the policy implications are, are huge. That's why I say I've never been busier than I have been lately with helping clients to update those policies because of exactly that. There's so many jurisdictional things that are going to have to come into play. You, you, you touch on the privacy, the privacy aspects. We haven't even opened the Pandora's box around security of these records. Yeah. Um, there's a <laughs> comment from, from James here. There's a major security issue with people handling records, either physical or electronic, with people working from home. And mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I don't know how that Pandora box closes again after this is over. Um, it, it, that requires massive policy changes. I mean, this is one of the one of the yeah. issues I ran with that uh, ran into with the, the the government example. It was how to transfer you know sensitive you know health in this case health health related information without a, a good system. So we needed we needed some form of encrypted sharing and that wasn't you know that wasn't in place. So we had to do a workaround. Basically. Wet wet signatures, notaries. We saw a, a digital notary company just become the the latest unicorn uh, startup. Um, it's there there are lots of innovations here that uh, companies are, are having to make decisions around and, and do it. How about much more rapidly? I -9 yeah, forms. I nines. That's right. a, a great example. Uh, a, a friend of mine uh, has been been dealing with I nines, and the requirement has always been that 
it's a, a wet signature with a notary um, mm-hmm. and and uh, what is it USCIS USCIS uh, one one of the the agencies had to um, develop temporary policy changes to continue to facilitate I nine signatures mm-hmm. um, that that are rescinded upon resumption of normal business activities after COVID nineteen. Yeah, uh, strange times. Strange, strange times. And, you know, uh, we're coming up on our, you know, our revised tax season. Um, so, you know, coming up on the, the 15th, but how do you file taxes, you know, doing it electronically. Um, and I, I just did the, the e-file, uh, you know, e-signature um, mm-hmm. to authorize the electronic filing. So it becomes a pure, you know, born digital, remains digital process. So it's that, you know, traditional leakage that happens that, People are creating something electronically and then they print it out and that printed copy then becomes the official record. And then we got to get back into the system, um, trying to keep things at a, a digital level throughout the entire process. And I so think that, that well, that's interesting. Go We've got see. Kayla here, one of the, uh, one of the members that it's mentioned, you know, what about sending faxes and what, what really even is an original anymore? And I think that's one of the things that we've been seeing with our clients is getting away from that word original because that's going to become uh, almost a, a non uh, point because it's about what's the master, what's mm-hmm. what's the one that is going to be that trusted source. Original, uh, it, re, the original source doesn't matter anymore as long as you have a trusted source and that master mm-hmm. version. And so that's where we're going into the policy implications part of this and, and changing the wording in policies to meet that exact issue right we, we can't just declare you know what paper is going to be our our uh, official records or electronic is our official records or we have to make some very clear statements these days on how we're going to manage these things and get away from terms like original yeah. it's, it's it's interesting to me that it's taken till till 2020 and this crisis to get in to really dig into that discussion because uh, you know we've been dealing with electronic records in, in the, my, my, my bent is, is from the discovery perspective, we've been dealing with these for quite some time and what is the real record and being able to authenticate it, um, you know, so this idea that it's still, um, you know, I don't know, I wanna say like uh, just anchored in this paper-based thinking yeah. of things and that that's still uh, part of our, our, our policy wording is, is just incredible to me and it's, it, I think that at least it's a positive thing that can come out of this. And I'm really reassured to hear that you're, you're seeing people reword those policies. So um, I do want to move on so we can open this up for questions. This is a fantastic discussion and we should really have made this two hours. <laughs> so um, hopefully if we don't get to all of our questions, um, maybe we can you know, just sit down and, and go through those together uh, so that we can um, share them with our, with our audience. I, I would like to touch on just, you know, and I think we've, we've, discuss some of this how is how is digital transformation like how does how does having a digital transformation strategy already having that in place or getting one in place improve your efficiency responsiveness and reflexibility and resiliency i think the obvious one that we've been talking about today is if you were prepared um this this transformation to working from home and doing things remotely was less disruptive you could you could move pretty quickly through that um, do you have anything else to add before we move on to questions? Well, I think it's, it's very interesting because, you know, you've got uh, two, two speakers here that come from a traditionally paper dependent business. You know, mm-hmm. we've been, access has been the business of, of storing paper in, in boxes. Um, we, we are focused on helping customers transform um, because not only the the efficiency, um, the fact that that office may not be there, you can't have files um, trapped there. You need to have uh, digital processes to manage the the information. Um, So it it transforms our way of looking at, but also within that, there are not only efficiencies, but cost savings. Mm -hmm. So what is the most efficient model and how, how do we take advantage of that to create a more uh, efficient, optimized process that ultimately is going to save money. Mm-hmm. 
Well, and I think the, from the responsiveness perspective, obviously people have had to respond whether they liked it or not. Um, so I, I think this is going to help increase the responsiveness, honestly. Once we start down the road of, of electronic capture and we get our IG uh, house in order, I think the responsiveness will be, it, it can't help but be increased. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, this, is, this is a good push. I, can I pick up one point from our previous, um, we were talking about digital transformation in, in regards to our records and what's an original. Um, the principles still apply. The generally accepted record keeping principles, I, I think our records managers among us will, will cheer that statement. Whether, whether we're working from an office or we're working from home, the principles still apply. So the, the principles of, of um, integrity, uh, and, and I think that one probably applies most here is uh, it, it does still apply whether whether we're in that office or we're we're working from home. Um, it's just now understanding how we implement those in a new fashion. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So I'm going to open it up to Q and A, um, Steve. Unless you, sorry, um, if you had a comment there. I, again, I'm sorry. I keep I keep talking over you. My oh, apologies. Right. So, all right. Let's move no, to Q and A. So. Uh, here, here's one question. Have you ever come across a paper heavy business process that absolutely could not be digitized? Do business process owners ever have a legitimate reason to not go digital? Um, in, in a number of cases, we had clients go, we just don't think we can do this. Um, I, I had one client who deals with medical uh, physician files. And they thought, no, no, we've got to have all this in, in paper form. We've got to have these signatures that show what they've done and all this stuff. And, and in the end, we were able to actually walk them through. So even some of the toughest clients, um, we've been able to make that happen. So I would say no. I, haven't, I personally haven't run into one that we haven't been able to help them to make that digital transformation. And in the end, they were a lot happier that they had done it instead mm -hmm. of not having done it. I mean, one that comes to mind for me is maybe the, the nuclear industry. I think I was I was at a conference sitting with someone who was in a, you know, in a, you know, go paperless kind of uh, web uh, session. And, you know, she said, wait, wait, this doesn't apply to me. I have to keep everything. So what about, I don't know if you've worked with that industry in particular, but that's one that I'm, I'm thinking of. Well, and I, I think it, you know, it, it almost becomes sort of a, a, a trivia question to try and find one yeah. <laughs> where, where it doesn't apply, which kind of, kind of speaks to the point that it's less a issue of, you know, is it the right path, but what's the change management? What's the cultural shift? because so much of this has been rooted in people being used to paper um, and industries that are very paper dependent. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the pandemic has forced the adoption. You, you have to get over the, you know, the, the cultural issues, the, the reluctance, mm -hmm. um, those things now have uh, been swept aside by the necessity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, sh that's shown that, um, yeah, it can be done. It's it's more efficient, and also we're finding that the productivity. Everyone was, you know, no one was was ready to. Okay, everyone go work from home. We'll see what happens. We'll see if you're still productive. Um, and now people are finding yeah, we're pretty productive. Maybe we don't need to go back to the office. Um, and we like to get rid of that office. That's really expensive to have all that space. If you can work from home, so we're getting a lot of our business pushing to. Hey, we're going to cut our, get rid of one of these offices, scoop out all of those paper records um, because they need to be digitized, digitize for us, deliver it through our systems. But it's a cost reduction and that office footprint is now shrinking. There, there are maybe, maybe one or two um, examples I can think of that are, are you, you can't digitize and it, it all has to do with, with the regulations on that industry. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think um, this moment in time actually gives us the impetus to say, hey, you know that outdated regulation that industry X has been saying for decades is out of date and is, is forcing us to do some really stupid things with information to make sure we meet that compliance requirement. Mm -hmm. Now's the point to push back on the regulators and say, hey, that rule is stupid still. Please change it because we can't do it anymore mm -hmm. because all of our employees are working from home. 
Mm -hmm. um, I, I think there's an opportunity to finally get some of those outdated and antiquated rules off of the books. Mm -hmm. I think I think necessity is going to push regulation changes in the same way that that yeah. Steve and, and Kurt are seeing. It's it's just driving massive policy. Uh, changes within organizations. Let's move on to one or two more questions here, see what we can get in. Um, so what are some of your uh, thoughts uh, that you, or notes that you have on how to decide what to capture or not? So you talked about, you know, it's not a good idea to just scan everything. Um, how do you, how do you get people to distinguish between what's, what's uh, of value and what isn't? So well, my, I, I, my first thought is, is Sorry, was it originally captured in an electronic form anyway? Because we see this over and over again where people have these piles of paper in their office, but it's all printed. It came from an, uh, an electronic source to begin with. You've already got it captured electronically. Let's not rescan some of this stuff. So making sure that you, you're clear on where it was originally captured. Now, if it came into you through the mail, well, maybe it's important enough that you do have to capture it. Mm -hmm. But most things these days, let's face it, they're coming from an original electronic source. Why are we scanning stuff like that? I, I, I mean, as, love, as much as you know, we at Access would love to take your money to uh, scan the world, we don't want to do that because it's not the right thing to do. We want to make sure that you're only scanning the right information that, that really is essential, that has to be geographically dispersed, that has mm -hmm. to be used to make decisions. I mean, that's the stuff, you know, if there's risk related, we want to capture those things. But there's a lot of day-to-day -day records that um, are in paper form that should probably just mm -hmm. stay there and, and you know, let their retention run out and then get rid of them. We don't have to scan at all. Kurt? Yeah, and I think that's, that's, that's exact, exactly it. How do you form a strategy around this um, and, and look at the, the sources? Where's paper coming into the process? Mm -hmm. uh, as Steve mentioned, a lot of times it was digital already. So keep Someone it printed, in right. a digital format. Mm -hmm. Look at your active information, um, scan that, as it's as it's needed mm -hmm. and then the things that are more uh inactive archival well apply the the policies and retention to reduce those so it's it's very much not about wholesale imaging and digital transformation being yeah. let's go and scan everything let's get into a digital format in a strategic mm -hmm. way Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm, I'm going to wrap this up. Um, we do have a suggestion, just I, I want to mention it. There, there are a lot of other questions here and uh, people are asking for sort of a follow-up Q&A session. If you guys are open for that, I would be thrilled to do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. are, just one last question is, are there, uh, in this session is, are there any technologies to eliminate manual, ent uh, manual excuse me, manual errors, and apparently spoken errors, uh, while you're capturing information? So I know there's certainly a wealth of stuff that I can think of that helps you reconcile uh, information in your, in your digital environment, but let me open that up to you and then we'll, we'll wrap right. up for today. I'll give you a, a quick answer. So, so yes, absolutely. But the, the, you know, the, there's a lot of detail around that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we get very industry specific. So understanding that process, how do we put the right, right tools, right process uh, in, in place for that? And we certainly, we've had discussions on during our webinars about, um, you know, using the technology that's available to compare data in one source versus another and, and, and you know, check that in, in live time to, to see if there are any inconsistencies. So, well, um, Steve, if, I don't know if you have anything to add, but um, if not, I'll, I'm going to wrap this, wrap this up. See, okay. Let's wrap right. it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I like the idea of, a, of another session. If, if you're open to that, that would be great. Um, I just want to thank uh, sure. all of our panelists for today's webinar and thank them for continuing to serve this community by sharing their knowledge. Our next uh, webinar will be announced very soon. So keep an eye on your uh, email inbox. But before we close, I'd like you I'd like to remind you to become a professional member of ARMA International and take this time to invest in yourself. ARM has an array of resources available for you, including white papers, training, articles in our magazine, and much more. And on behalf of our speakers and the wonderful folks at Access who give their time and money uh, to sponsor programs like this webinar today, um, and all of us at ARM International, um, have a great day. Thank you for joining us and stay safe and stay well. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.